Um, welcome, everybody. This is the in-process unwinding BOF. Um, there are a handful of slides, but they're mostly here to facilitate our conversation about uh, in-process unwinding. Uh, the presenter is Florian Weimer. Florian couldn't be here, unfortunately, so I'm presenting on his behalf. Florian is here online, though. Uh, Florian, can you say hello and introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Florian. I'm a GLIPC developer. Um, I work for Red Hat, and yeah, um, I got interested into the uh, LibGC Unwinder because of uh, scalability problems we saw. Um, we fixed those in collaboration between GCC and GLIPC in GC12 and GLIPC235, so we have now um, scalable unwinding across multiple threads. Um, I realize that unwinding is a bit of a contentious topic because um, uh, we see that a lot of our developers in the distributions uh, for, for in the GNU Linux uh, ecosystem don't actually use exceptions for C and C++. Um, a lot of the major programs like GCC, Firefox, Chromium, Clang, uh, all don't use exceptions even though they are written in C++. On the other hand, we know from our, from the feedback we get from our commercial customers that there's quite a bit of C++ software out there that actually uses exceptions. Um, so we are in the strange situation where we may not have personal experience with exception handling in the software we maintain, but it's still an important feature to some of our users. Um, there's ongoing debate in the C++ community whether Exception handling is, is a good thing. Um, our implementation is based on the Itanium C++ ABI. We use uh, declarative tables and small code fragments written in a special dwarf-based language um, to facilitate the unwinding. Um, the bulk of the implementation is in libgcc um, or libgcc underscore s, I should say. Uh, nowadays, we uh, have a bit of support for that from glibc by for locating the shared object that contains the tables and get a pointer to the online table so that the libgcc unwinder can use that. And yeah, there's also a little bit of vignette support for that. Um, the GLPC implementation of uh, POSIX thread cancellation and pthread exit actually uses unwinding behind the scenes, uh, but that's not actually a requirement from POSIX. We do that for interoperability with uh, C++ exception handling so that when you cancel a thread or call pthread exit, on a thread, um, the uh, destructors for objects on the stack are invoked. But POSIX doesn't actually require this, and other libcs don't do this, so they just use set jump and long jump. Okay, so I guess that's, yeah, this is what I mentioned before. Um, the We improved the scalability for multiple threads of the unwinder. Um, yeah, Carlos wants uh, us to add a deal find object micro benchmark. We don't have that. Um, there's also a little bit of a to do item for TLIPC because uh, we have an alternative slow implementation of deal find object in TLIPC itself, and it's used uh, during deal open and deal sim to uh, identify the column in space. And we can actually switch to the new fast thing, but we don't do that today. Um, yeah, um, I've got some unwinding benchmarks, but it's hard to tell what's a representative um, 
workload, so to speak, what, what is really relevant. Do we need to unwind quickly through frames that don't have any destructors? Or is it more important to uh, invoke destructors quickly? And yeah, what's the typical size of a function through which you need to unwind? All these things, I don't really have good data on that. I, so for, yeah, I'd suggest we nerd snipe the community by putting in a micro benchmark that is not indicative of real world workloads and then just let people come and contribute better benchmarks. <laughs> Because <laughs> as soon as we contribute one micro benchmark, people will be like, that's not right. That, that's not what my application actually does. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Tell me about your application. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, oh, the, uh, this is the JIT case slide, which I think is probably the, the next thing. And Jason tells me that this is, has this committed or pushed now? Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about this, Florian? The the JIT case, I guess. Um, yeah, um, Thomas Neumann wrote a patch that eliminates the global lock in the unwinder for um, the frame registration path. So this is the path in the unwinder that deals with uh, explicitly registered uh, frame information, and that's typically used for uh, JIT compiled code so that that code can inter interoperate with the unwinder. The uh, uh, this isn't co covered with the uh, in the GCC 12 enhancements. So once you register a frame, which few programs do, but some do actually use this functionality. So once you register a frame, then <laughs> you still have you have another global log, a different global log, and Thomas Neumann's patch. Uh, eliminates that with some. Sure. Matthew has, his, memory. Matthew has his hand raised. Uh, so I had inter interesting discussions with uh, Microsoft actually back in 2019, and they asked, they told me about the pain they had uh, on Windows because each and every frame that was being registered by a JIT or unregistered, well, it was done piecewise. So they were uh, actually very uh, adamant at saying, well, you guys should think about batching that. So I don't know if this is planned or I mean something like, okay, please give me an area where I can eventually push, let's say, a thousand register frames, right? So, so that's allocated once through one call and then there's a handle where you could push this without calling back into mutexes and things, uh, he heavy stuff. Okay, so your, your, your point is, I'm gonna take a note about that. Your point is, rather than individual frame registration, register an area of memory where you can have like lock-free, I'm gonna insert all these things, all the frames I eventually wanna register into that space. And then eventually the unwinder can lazily go back and go, oh, well, by the way, what frames did you register? And they're all there. Yeah, because that stuff was becoming a, a, a contention point in their whole JIT. And it would be a shame that we'd have to do the same on, on Linux. Mm -hmm. So it's like a bulk frame registration yeah. interface. And I'm assuming you don't want to take any global locks for bulk frame registration either. You just want to do a deferred registration, like a wait-free queue or something, where you just say, oh, I'm going to be adding these frames to you later on. But I believe that the, the current interface oh, lets you... I, I don't know if it's on, is it? I believe it is. Okay, good. Uh, already lets you... Uh, register a table of, uh, of unwind entries, uh, not just one at a time. Yes, but you might be gradually adding some as you JIT, right? So I think it would be good to have something where you have, let's say, a free area where you can just push them efficiently rather than saying, let, let, so if you wait until you have 100 ready, while you wait, it, it's local to you. The system knows nothing about it, and those might be in use at some point, but I mean, the, the unwinder cannot know about them. Whereas if you have a free area, then the unwinder knows about that area, it's partially populated, and then you push them quickly. Yeah, I think yeah, the distinction would be rather than a, like 
here's my table, and it's, it's got a length. Here's my area, and it has a maximum number of entries possible yes. in it, and you're going to need to go back later when I'm in the process of unwinding and determine how many entries are actually added. Uh, Ian has a question. Well, I guess you might not be able to determine what the maximum is because frames are a variable size. So you can say how big the area is, but you can't necessarily say what its capacity is. Well, I mean, perhaps you could ask for an area, seeing a, mac a size you wanted to have, and then as you push things, I mean, you could have a counter at the beginning, seeing how many items are in there. But if, if you just register a blanket area and are writing actively in, inside of it, then you need to synchronize with whatever threads will actually use them. So, yes. So yep. then you would need some API how to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. You, you need a parallelism, you need a parallel and concurrent ABI there where you have to talk about what are the memory order semantics, what's the release acquire orders, how do threads add items to that queue so that the unwinder can see them, and how do they make those entries visible? Absolutely. If you're going to achieve, you know, high performance and throughput with the unwinder, then there's probably areas like this that can be explored. Um, Florian, do you want me to go to the next slide, I guess? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if actually uh, we need a new interface for this because you probably can already install a fake unwind table that covers your entire JIT area. And then as you JIT more code, you can then install more specific unwinders. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, if someone comes to us and has concrete requirements, I guess we can figure something out, but I'm not sure if that's actually needed at this point. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it'd be good to probably have an example use case of this where you write uh, some kind of toy example for jitting and then see if you can do the, the operation as Matthew describes. Um, the next slide I have is, uh, is your slide of low hanging fruit. Yeah, this is a bit of additional performance improvements we can make. Um, I noticed that there's a large mem set um, at the beginning of the UW frame state 4 function, and that seems to take 40% of its execution time. And um, UW frame state 4 seems to take like 10 to 15% of execution time doing unwinding, so it's, it's fairly a significant um, fraction of the entire time we spent there. Um, I think this is required because the dwarf specification says that the uh, registers are zero in the uh, virtual machine unless they are updated by the dwarf program. Um, but we zero more than just a register set at this point. We zero the entire struct. So maybe there's a smarter way of doing this, just yeah, clearing the register set and uh, initialize the rest in a more targeted fashion. Yeah. I, I think this for me comes back to if we don't have any micro benchmarks, we're not tracking the performance of the unwinder, but. Without those benchmarks, you can't measure it, and you don't know if it's changing over time. Uh, Jakob has a question. Uh, perhaps we could try to uh, clear something lazily on, on first access, but the problem, at least from what I vaguely remember from when, when touching this era, most of the structures are actually exposed by the ABI because of the unfortunate case that at some point in the past we used to have the unwinder also in the static libgcc.a and so some programs can have parts of the unwinder in themselves and then they uh, use the rest of the unwinder from the shared library and, and stuff like that and it was Basically, everything was was a part of a, of the API. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think it's something to investigate because it's unfortunate we have to zero all that memory for no purpose. Yeah, I think the uh, uh, the the implementation creates this object on the stack, and it doesn't really escape from there. So, yeah, we need to look at the the exact EBI impact, but it, it seemed to be fairly internal, and it's also not declared in the install header file. So, yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's obviously a concern. If it's ABI, then we can't try, can't change it. The, the problem I, I remember was that just yeah, the certain and uh, certain functions were exported from the binaries or shipped in, and not all of them. So, for some symbols, you you went to to one implementation, and mm -hmm. for for the others, you. And we we also have well, some of the entry points are duplicated in GLPC as well. For very old targets, so it's, I think it's mostly I386 at this point. Maybe, yes. Yeah, it, uh, it was changed in GLPC 2.1, so uh, anything later than that doesn't have the local implementation anymore, which causes other problems for us, but uh, yeah, because we, we need to deal up in libgc underscore s on the first call to pthread exit. And yeah, maybe the application has called change root or uh, is under low memory pressure or something like that. So then it, it can, uh, yeah, we can end up uh, terminating the process at this point. Yeah, that, that late DL open is certainly a risk for us, whether you're in a different mountain namespace or true or other things. It's yeah. not, it's not great. Yeah, and there is some, some code in there that in, uh, creates the initial inlining context and that code, uh, UW install context one, seems to be extremely generic and it looks like we could specialize this based on architectural knowledge. It's, seems to be a loop over a descriptor and copies over stuff. And I think that's just uh, yeah, writing reg register state from one place to the other to another place. And we know the registers of the architecture and the layout. So we should be able to re uh, simplify and optimize that quite significantly. But curiously, even though this code looks quite complicated and expensive, it's not really showing up in profiles very at a very top spot. Yeah. Matthew? Yeah, maybe one approach, I mean, uh, could be to uh, create a new version of the unwinder with a new API and ABI that are meant for speed. And then if you want to reuse that code internally, you could convert back to the pre-existing APIs and ABIs so that the same code could be used maybe in a slower fashion to expose the old APIs. Uh, but I mean, if, if the data structures that are publicly exposed is the limited factor, you might want to consider just exposing a different API, an ABI. Yeah, it, it's possible. Which kind of brings me onto something we were discussing in the corridor the other day, which is certain classes of frame can be compacted and there have been at least two implementations of that. One that um, Catherine Moore did for MIPS, and obviously there's the one that Apple have for Darwin. So if you've got a class of um, unwind frame, which is relatively normal, you can actually re-represent it as just a small set of 32-bit numbers. And I guess the first motivation for that was to reduce the size of frames, but the second motivation is gonna be that it's faster to process as well. So if we decided to have a second ABI, it could be a good time to bring something like that in. Yeah, you're saying the compressed frame idea? Yeah. yeah. How do you feel about writing a new ABI, Florian? <laughs> I don't think we need a new ABI because the current ABI is, I think it's very opaque, the implementation. Um, 
It's not really exposing an internal. So it, as Jakob said, we need to investigate what the actual ABI footprint for historic reasons is, but um, we don't need uh, uh, the, the internals are pretty well hidden at this point. The, the question is that, or some feedback we got is that the uh, back callback based backtrace generation interface is problematic for some use cases. So the feedback we got there is that an iterator based uh, interface might be prefer preferable to some users and we don't have that in libgc underscore s at this point. Mm -hmm. And that might be some motivation why people look at a different unwinding or backtrace generation framework. Mm -hmm. So we want to create new interfaces and that's probably the direction that's most pressing at this point. Yeah. Um, is there any point in talking about like the different motivating use cases for the in-process unwind? Like we've had some users talk to us about wanting to do like in-process mini dumps with backtraces and things. And I feel like backtracing is this whole other conversation that's separate from the unwinder. But some users have expressed an interest in saying, well, I, I don't want to do out of process unwind. I want to do in process mini dumps. Yeah, there's a, quite a bit of tension there because in what we see uh, is that un, in process for unwinding can't really be made reliable. Um, once you've got arbitrary memory corruption, you don't really want to keep running in that process and not try to create a backtrace, maybe even calling into malloc. Um, and I think there's a, f a slide for this fellow towards yeah. the end. Is it the, oh yeah, beyond performance. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the issue there is, uh, and so we generally uh, recommend to let the system call dump handler. Um, so Linux has a facility where you can invoke, a, the kernel invokes a process to generate the call dump and you can actually uh, inspect the process image before it's written to disk and generated backtrace without having to write all the, the data to disk. So, even if you have a multi gigabyte process, you can generate a mini core dump um, from, from the, basically the, the process just before it becomes a zombie process. Um, and this seems to be the direction where we should be going. But on the other hand, not every application developer has this integrated system approach and uh, they need to run on systems and collect debug information where this data is not available to them or they can't install that kind of uh, global system-wide crash handler. So that's why we're stuck with um, the yeah, interest in in process backtrace generation on crashes. And for that, the our unwinder is not really suitable because once you've got stack corruption, it's likely that the unwinder will itself crash, yeah, because it uh, it reads through the stack and does, there's no validation of any pointers there. Yeah, and this is in, indeed a separate conversation from unwinding. So, for exception handling, you you really have to assume that the stack is uncorrupted. There's no good way around that. Mm -hmm. um, but backtracing is different. Yeah, Matthew has his hand raised. Matthew? Yes, uh, so this ties into something I'd like to solve also uh, from a kernel tracer perspective. So what I'd like to do is to be able to use, well, both the EH frame information that would be properly registered to the kernel and maybe those areas where the JITs populate their, uh, their frame information 
from, for, let's say, stack walking from a system call, stack walking from an interrupt handler in the kernel. So maybe if we solve that problem at the kernel level, there we can check if the actual accesses are valid. So maybe that could solve the backtrace generation as well, because there, I mean, we won't crash. We can validate if each access is valid. So you mean delegate this in-process backtrace generation to something in the kernel? Yeah. But once you get to the user space boundary, the user space code, how do you validate the, is your, you have to unwind the user space code, and that's a dwarf, un, that's an exception unwind process. Close. Well, I mean, it, if the information that is provided to, cur to the kernel is simple enough that it can be understood and interpreted within the kernel, then we could do the backtrace with get user and everything and, and walk and gather the information. Isn't that equivalent to having a dwarf unwinder in the kernel, which has already been rejected, I it's, guess? We, a small, small, tiny subset. So, and that, that's where we, we mm. need to design the information so it's simple enough to consume by a tr trivial unwinder. Uh, and maybe it's a subset. Uh, there are things like ORC, which went into the kernel, which adds section, but it's kind of a very, very simplified dwarf. Yeah. That the, only the, has what The problem needed. is that to like get to the full expressibility that user space has, the ORC unwinder is going to turn into a dwarf unwinder. And then you're into having a dwarf unwinder. Yeah. Zabosh. Uh, mention one thing that we have return address signing where return addresses are signed and it's described in the dwarf information. So like, how do you design a simple thing when architectures add features that try to conceal the backtrace? You mean pointer signing? So return address signing makes the return address signed and memory. Mm -hmm. so it's not easy for the kernel to, to, to process that unless it understands the architecture-specific extensions to the dwarf. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think this beyond performance slide is going to need a broader community discussion, probably between the kernel and user space over how do we do this in a more safe fashion? But it, I guess it does tie into, Florian, I'd forgotten about this slide completely when I mentioned my comment about the in-process mini dumps. But um, there are real users that want in-process mini dumps because they're, they're not, they have applications that aren't directly integrated into the distro. So they're not using necessarily or can even use all the distro features. And they just want to get a mini dump of their application because they control all the parts of that application. But the in-process unwinder under corruption that isn't robust enough for them. But then maybe the answer is, sorry, use your own unwinder. Use some other unwinder that you link in that's robust against corruption and do that for your, for your mini dumps. Let um, me go back just, here. Just a quick thing before you, yeah, to the performance slide, right? So I just checked uh, the, the frame state uh, is local to the implementation. It's all, it's all used in static functions except for the pre-GCC 3.0 entry point frame frame frame, frame four. Yeah, it's safe as well. Yeah, right. So um, it, it should be easy to do something else than the indeed a little bit over the top mem set for every <laughs> frame. Yeah, <laughs> and this is why it's called low hanging fruit. Yeah, so. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. it, it's safe to do. So one, yeah, one yeah. Quick. let's pass the microphone up to Jakob. One quick possibility how to just make, make the memset smaller would be uh, we have an array uh, we, for, for each register which contains where the register is and uh, whether it's saved or whatever, uh, whatever state it has. So the default is register is unsaved. And so if we could have instead two arrays, one of the enum, enum and one of the rest, then it would compact well. Uh, right now, I think we have some padding in there. So it would be both smaller and we could just memset uh, the states of the registers and keep the rest uninitialized. Or, of course, we could have some counter how many registers we have initialized. And, and uh, for instance, we could guess that 
for, for each ar architecture defines some, some number of registers we want always to be defined and the rest of them, the high registers would be lazily initialized by or something similar. Mm -hmm. Did you get any notes for that, Florian, I guess? Yeah, I think I feel like we discussed this before. <laughs> I don't now remember. Yeah. There might also be a way to just reuse the frame state. And... Yeah. And we've got a comment from someone in the in the room just waiting. Yes, keep pressing the uh, button. Yeah, I had a comment on the discussion that we were having around um, if the stack is corrupt, then what options do we have for unwinding? So, yeah, falling back on frame pointer is something, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be a viable solution. But the problem there is that there are few of these positions in the function where you cannot be relying on the frame pointer, right? So maybe in that case, I don't know if it's a good idea, but maybe we reflect when we do give these backtraces that these are uh, best effort backtraces. So sort of something like what Kernel does by marking, uh, I don't know it, it, how that uh, interfaces with the user, but something like marking, is this reliable or is this a best effort backtrace or, you know, something like that may be useful. Maybe it's, uh, you know, an extended feature, but it seems to be useful when I think about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's been general discussions in Fedora about whether we emit the frame pointer or not based on workloads that people want to use. But I think like uh, from the compiler or system engineering perspective, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Oh. From the compiler or system engineering perspective, that extra register is really valuable for use in generating code. So I mean, you like it, it's not that you don't even have the frame pointer, sometimes you never have the frame pointer. There's no frame pointer. You're always using that register for something else, you know, to reduce register pressure, to improve scheduling, to improve performance. Um, should we go to this slide, Florian, the specialized read and code value with base? Yeah, that's uh, related to finding the, uh, what's it called, FDE frame data entry. In uh, in the uh, in the exception handling frame table, and um, the the, the uh, binary search we do there has this extremely generic implementation that can deal with all encodings. But I think GCC only emits like one or two different encodings, so for different things. So we just could special case that and move the check out of the loop instead of doing a check on every uh, branch inside the uh, lookup tree or where, where we do the binary, binary search. Yeah. And this is, can be quite expensive uh, as well. And if you look at uh, some of the old discussion about dwarf unwinding in the kernel before the org unwinder got implemented, they had a custom unwinder that spent like a, a significant amount of time in dwarf uh, a little engine one hundred uh, base one hundred twenty eight decoding. And on many kinds of CPUs, it's possible to sort of vectorize that or use. Uh, Simd with an register technologies for that. Um, and this shows up in our profiles a little bit as well, not as highly as the uh, kernel people reported with their custom dwarf and winder, but it's there. And yeah, that's something we could do as well. Yeah. Um, and that would be totally localized and fairly straightforward, I guess. And if we can, if we, uh, we can also skip bounds checking if we know that the, uh, the frame is sufficiently large, the exception ending frame is sufficiently large and doesn't end exactly on a page boundary so that we can overwrite like, over overread like uh, seven bytes or so 
but that makes it makes the implementation a little bit more efficient too. Mm-hmm. Um, you sound unconvinced. <laughs> say again. You sound unconvinced. Uh, no, I was looking at Jakob, who made faces when you said the vectorized ULEB 128 decoding. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we added that entry to the low-hanging fruit, but I know that uh, we, we, uh, like when you and I discussed it, you would put a big smiley face beside that one, because I think it was kind of like one of these far-fetched ideas that we would just throw it out at the boff. So, yeah, we don't know if it would be effective, but it might be. Uh, Zabolsh has his hand raised. Or... So the usual size of ULAP 128 is, is less than 8 bytes, so we don't actually need to vectorize anything. We need to, we need to just come up with some integer magic uh, to detect size and quickly decode it uh, without any sort of falling back into vectors. We have 64-bit registers. So Another thing that came to my mind is that if you only want backtrace, nowadays Intel has a magic shadow stack feature, which might allow you to just read out the return addresses. So I can answer that question. Yes. So, but um, you kind of have, like we're in this game where like if you wait for the hardware to catch up to us, you'll have shadow stack and the shadow stack has the perfect EIP, EIP minus one, EIP minus two, EIP minus three. It's got everything encoded in the shadow stack. So as soon as you catch up and all the hardware has shadow stack, you kind of get the backtrace of the frames really easily. So all this work that you're doing here to make in process backtrace work just becomes irrelevant once the hardware, both Intel and AMD hardware, catch up with the shadow stack feature. You're not wrong, which is why we're mostly focusing on improving the in-process unwinding, which will improve C++ exception handling and will improve, you know, p-thread cancellation and all those other things. Whereas I think there's a, I'd like to say we're focusing less on the in-process backtrace aspect of it because we think that once the hardware catches up, the in-process backtrace becomes much easier. And then we're also no longer having the conversation with our users where the users are saying, please, can you just turn on the frame pointer because the frame pointer is so easy to use. And we're saying, well, but if we take away the frame pointer, that has performance impact in all the generated code and you can never change that generated code again. Whereas the CPU feature for uh, shadow stacks makes it that much easier. So, yes. So, uh, concerning the still vectorizing uh, ULIP uh, 128, uh, I think uh, if you would see that um, most 90% of all the ULIPs you, you are going to see are four, boards, four bytes or more, then of course you can use the vectorized in, uh, vector instruction to check whether all the, all the uh, upper bits are set and, and do fast path that way. But, other than that, I'm afraid, because for each byte you need to check if it if it's the terminating one, and you need to shift them uh, together. Uh, and regarding the backtrace, uh, the thing is, if if you have hardware uh, buffer, then it will be fixed size, uh, and so the question is what to do when when the fixed size is not enough, and. The problem is that in order to unwind beyond that, it's not enough to know the uh, the program counters on the uh, on the backtrace, but you know to uh, you need to know the state of several other registers, and so you need to unwind them. And and for unwinding, of course, you need all the registers, not not just the program counter. The hope with a shadow stack is that at least for backtrace generation, it's going to be complete because it's, yeah, sort of, it has to be as large as the, uh, um, the actual stack because the hardware verifies that the addresses on the actual stack and the shadow stack are the same. Y so, y yes. has so, so for, uh, for the, if all you care is about the return addresses and nothing else, 
and you double check that the upper or one of the addresses uh, at the top of the stack is, is your underscore start, then, then you are fine and you can use it, but otherwise you need to do the full unbinding if the user uh, is not satisfied with, with seeing just, just some inner frames and nothing else beyond that. True. Yeah, and S390 and ARM won't have this shadow stack feature, I think, anytime soon. So we, we have to deal with uh, backtrace generation on these architectures by different means anyway. Power always has a frame point or something like it. So it's a bit of an outlier there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it has it in, in the ABI, so it, it's hard to avoid it. You can, but uh, it's not standard ABI. Yep. Um, you know, I think we've already talked a bit about this beyond performance. Um, I mean, process VM read V in some other cases could be useful. Um, even if, even if we're just talking about unwinding during an error, right? Uh, most of the time you expect it to be consistent, but if you catch a couple more cases and then you can abort the process before you get into trouble, I guess. Yeah, I think for backtrace generation, we don't really need the kernel assist for this because um, if we can export the stack boundary information from glibc, then this will tell the unwinder what to expect already. So unless the uh, the application calls and protect on a stack address. Yeah. We should be okay to read there because it's backed by memory. Um, but if there's a stack switch, then we need to fall back to process VM read V mm -hmm. to probe uh, the pages. But we it, it's only necessary to probe at a page granularity. And then, then yeah, the, the process VM read V call can probe like, uh, we could probe like 16 pages at a time or something. So it shouldn't be too bad from an from a performance perspective, especially uh, if we can use the stack boundary information in the majority of cases. Mm -hmm. I have something to mention there, but I'm gonna let Ian talk first. Go ahead, Ian. So um, I asked Ian Lance Taylor why he'd made a different implementation for the backtrace. And the answer was because when you're doing a backtrace, you can't do any memory allocation. So there may be other constraints outside what we've been discussing that make a difference between the two tasks. Um, Florian, you and I talked about RSS usage during unwinding, but I think we don't generally do any allocations during that path unless... Um, that's changed in GC12. So uh, in the past, we had this lock there and called into the illiterate Piedra. Mm. And that was yeah, not async signal safe and generally not a good idea for backtracing. But this is gone now and the, uh, the GLIPC implementation is async signal safe and lock free. So mm -hmm. um, you can call it at any time, basically. Yeah. What, uh, the uh, Thomas Neumann's uh, new implementation isn't async signal safe. So that's still even though it's uh, it's more scalable, it doesn't have uh, the property that uh, the GLIPC implementation has that, it, that it's it's not re-entrant. So the GLIPC uh, implementation basically has two copies of the data and overwrites only one at a time. And if we get an interrupt or signal while you're updating one copy, the other copy is active and can be read and um, has consistent data. Mm -hmm. So that's why it uh, solves this issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but uh, I guess the backtrace has the same um, backtrace has the same uh, requirements, not wanting to allocate anything. Yeah, but uh, it has to get the the, uh, the um, draft data from somewhere, so it I don't know how it uh, deals with the GNPC lock there. I saw that lib unwind on some targets goes directly to ALF headers and tries to get 
the information from there. That's kind of scary. Um, what was the other thing? Yeah, and there's uh, historically that, or even today, is uh, if you call a backtrace function from glibc, then this may lazily load libgcc underscore s and call malloc indirectly. So that's why it's a kind of a bad interface for doing um, um, doing a crash backtraces because you don't want to call deal open on a crash. Mm -hmm. But you can work around that by calling backtrace once at the start of the process or just using the Itanium ABI functions directly and link to libgc underscore s so that uh, these functions don't have to be loaded lately. Mm -hmm. So on the topic of exactly what are the requirements or on the functions, uh, I had trouble on, uh, um, recently uh, when I looked at uh, functions, I had trouble understanding exactly in which situations they are supposed to work. And I came to the conclusion that we do support and rely on unwinding to work from signal handlers for asynchronous cancellation. So the unwind, uh, in process unwind should work from signal handlers. Uh, but this is not very clear from the source code comments or documentation. Um, so that's something. Uh, so here it, it, you mentioned uh, uh, stack switching. There is some problem if some, somebody switches the stack. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what that affects, but again, if the middle of long jump is interrupted and long jump is switching a stack, then it probably doesn't work, the unwinder, because we don't have dwarf information uh, necessary in long jump to make that work. But I think asynchronous cancellation relies on this. Of course, asynchronous cancellation, you can't use long jump, but correct. It's it not is not, clear it is exactly. undefined. Uh, last time I looked at it, it was not clear the exact bounds, but uh, where unwind supposed to work and one unwind not supposed to work. The, I mean, the intent for POSIX for asynchronous unwind was you have a block of computation that you can't normally interrupt in any other way. And then the asynchronous cancellation is to stop your thread from doing like some core computational routine. You can only call a very few things when you're in a asynchronous cancellation context. Uh, for me, the asynchronous cancellation thing was clear. It was not clear, but unwind supposed to support in libgcc. Mm. Uh, what, what, what situations you, you are supposed to be able to unwind? Um, I don't know. I always thought it was not, I mean, I don't know if Nathan Sidwell's here because he's worked on a lot of the unwind code, but... Um, so the, the current implementation, uh, so what we need, obviously need to support is synchronous signals. So if you get a division by zero or a segmentation fault, then you can actually unwind through that. That's generally not a problem. I believe the current implementation of the core unwinder is itself async signal safe once we eliminate the, uh, we've eliminated the GLFC lock. So that should work. What's not async signal safe is that is the C++ throw. So even if you throw an, you can throw a synchronous, from a, you can throw from a synchronous signal handler if you want to. But uh, throwing from uh, within an asynchronous signal and catching within the same signal the, the exception so that it doesn't leak out, that's still not valid because we call malloc during um, a C++ throw. Co correct, yeah. Um, and and, I think but if you call the unwinder directly, then this is not really a problem. It's supposed to be able to unwind through an asynchronous signal. 
the core issue we have with GCC generated code is that the tables aren't correct for asynchronous unwind, uh, asynchronous cancellation. So it does, there's some issues. I, I think Andrea Schwab filed a bug report for this or discussed it on this Lipsic Alpha a year or two ago. Um, basically, the, the boundaries are not entirely correct. So you might not get the correct, uh, if, if you have a cancellation async, a cancellation handler using the exception tables in the function and the, the, uh, the tables are not necessarily aligned or they're not, they're, they're not they're all the required compiler fences there so that the exception regions are clearly separated even in the presence of asynchronous signals. So I think that's more of a compiler issue with the table generation and code generation than the unwind the implementation as such, but it might be difficult to fix. Is this, was this a discussion where if an asynchronous signal arrives, exactly where the boundaries of the generated tables are? Like I remember there yeah, being- I think, uh, uh, I hope I can find this quickly, but I'm not sure if I'll- Yeah, I remember this discussion and that there were some like off by one issues that like the compiler would generate the table for the exception areas and then if you were like what if an exception arrived at this instruction and 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 you walked the whole list of these things you would find that at some of the transition points it wasn't you couldn't really say well i feel you we had some opinions about whether we felt it was correct that if the signal arrived here it should have really been in the previous section so there's this old, uh, I found it, um, hopefully I can find the archive link, async cancellation and pthread cleanup push. Mm -hmm. And okay. yeah, this really needs to be, it doesn't work because of this issue. This was in, yeah, it was a year ago. I'm going to put a link into the chat, to the thread. Is it in a GCC's I, Bugzilla? I don't know. <laughs> this is, okay. I only have the Lipsy Alpha thread. Okay, so this, yeah. Okay. Ah, it's a Lipsy Alpha thread. And I think we thread. concluded that this is a GCC limitation. Okay. I think I'll have to add that as notes to the talk, which I can then turn into PDF. So I'll make sure I'll make a note of that. If you can send that to me by email, I'll add it to the slides. Yep. I don't, I don't know if a GC bug was filed. Mm. Okay. Um, I think, what do we end at 4.30 today? We've got three minutes left in the MOF. Yes, that, I think correct? that's good. Yeah. Okay. And that was really the last slide. I think we walked through everything that, that we had in the, uh, in the notes. Um, any questions from those of you here at the BOF? I have a question for Jason. Because we're talking about um, the val validity of throwing, I guess, what does the C++ standard say about signals and exceptions and throwing exceptions? From a signal handler? Yeah. I, I think you're not supposed to? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I think the standard says don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the... The number of things you can do in a signal handler are fairly limited. Yeah. 
But from an implementation perspective, if you get a div by zero, you really do want to be able to like unwind through the whole thing and then get back out to the, you know, throwing, throwing something. But you're not throwing from the handler. You're just unwinding from that point to the point in which you're going to throw something else in the rest of your program. Um, I feel um, that... Ada actually throws the exception from the signal handler, I think. But Ada exceptions are carefully designed so that you don't need to call malloc for them. I think the, the biggest issue is that like, if you're in the middle of throwing, you've taken the, the EH lock, or there's an EH table lock or something, and then when you get the signal again and you try to take that lock again, you're just dead lock. Like, yeah, but it's for division by zero as a syn synchronous signal, that's not an issue. Yeah, yes. But yeah, if you, if you try to throw while there's already an exception in, in flight, then, then you terminate. Yeah, but as Florian said, the exception of div by zero is always synchronous, uh, unless you're on an architecture where the div by zero is lazy and deferred, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, <laughs> so no, no. so you could, while you're doing that math operation in the middle of your try and you get a div by zero, that's synchronous because at that point you have a well-defined spot where you are, you take the signal and then you just unwind and you come back out again. I'm a bit confused because, I mean, we, we have the possibility in the unwinder to see if it is a single frame or not, right? So and the point of that is to adjust the return address to either minus one or not doing minus one, right? So uh, I think it all should work. I mean, maybe it's not supposed to be done. Maybe it's even invalid to do, but it should work just fine. The unwinding, I mean, the exception throwing is something on top, right? <laughs> but the, yeah. the unwinding the, should work. It works when the signal generated is synchronous with respect to the operation that you are doing in the middle of the block. The problem is there are some architectures, for example, like, I'm not saying this is a good example, but PA risk has deferred FPU delivery of that, that, that signal. And so we try to avoid that at all costs. So, but... Yeah, but, no, but, but even asynchronous signals that basically, I mean, if you send a signal to a process that's uh, you know, remote uh, to a remote, remote process that's asynchronous, right? So, and that the single handler therein should always be able to unwind with the dwarf unwinder. Yeah, but if you're in the middle of throwing, when that happens, yeah, well, uh, that's that's a different discussion. But, but, but are, are, we, yeah. are we discussing throwing or are we discussing unwinding only? That's, uh, I mean, it's related, of course, but yeah, yeah. The the current GCC twelve implementation with GCC two thirty five can always unwind. Not throw, yeah. but unwinding yes. works because the lock is gone. So you, if, if by unwind you also mean clean up, then I think what works today is that if the signal interrupt happens in a function that doesn't have cleanup handlers, then exception throwing works. But if it, that function happens to have cleanup handlers and you interrupt at an awkward position, then it might not work because it doesn't know if it has to run the cleanup handlers or not. It might run the cleanup handlers when it shouldn't and might not run the cleanup handlers of that frame. So. Yeah, we, well, but, you can but, actually instruct the, GCC to build. It, there, there is a, the signal arrives at us when the program counter is at a certain location, right? So it arrives when it arrives. And then from that point on, the, um, it's clear where the cleanup handlers, which cleanup handlers are to be run, viewed from that program counter on. It might not be the ones that you want to be running, but uh, but it's, it's an asynchronous signal. So it could have arrived at a random time, so you get random cleanups, right? But whatever yeah. the right ones are from from this program counter. It is. It's not observable, right? Like where that signal lands. If it lands a little too late, then that's where it lands, and you don't run those cleanups. Right, you had no control over where that sig when that signal was going to be delivered. Yeah, and GC can also optimize the uh, online tables based on the assumption that no asynchronous sim signals happen. Yeah, for sure. And thank. Uh, yeah. Okay, we're out of time. We're out of time, thank but you. thank you. For